another example of an algorithm on graphs is this thing called coloring, graph coloring, right? So why is graph coloring important? Let's take as an example a problem of register allocation, right? Now this is again something which we will look at a little bit later, but you can get the gist of the problem uh, in a relatively simple uh, example over here. Let's say that you have a code, you know, written in a language like C, which basically has these instructions, right? A equal to B plus C, D equal to A plus C, F equal to D minus 1. And the question I'm going to ask is how many registers are needed, right? So what does that even mean? Let's say that I'm going to compile this and convert this into some kind of assembly language. An example, it could look like this, right? There are six variables, A, B, C, D, E, F. So it looks as though six registers might be needed. Right? And the code itself could look something like this, right? Load B and put it into some register R1. Load C, put it into R2. This is the actual add, right? So R3 clearly in this case corresponds to A. Then load E into R4. Once again, this is an add and this is the last subtract operation. Okay. So clearly with six registers, I can solve the problem. There is no concern about that. The question is, do I really need six or could I have done it more efficiently? Now, you know, hopefully all of you have uh, looked at the code and you know, you are, uh, it's very obvious that I don't need six. Okay. The question is, how low can I go? Right? How, what's the minimum that I can get away with? One way to think about it is, look at an operation like this. Right? I need to at least have R1 and R2 in separate registers. That is to say B and C have to be in separate registers. Right? It's not necessary that R3A has to be a separate register. I might have chosen to take the value of B plus C and put it back into the same register. Right? What I mean is, the names that I give the registers in my original C code have nothing to do with the names that I can finally use for them inside the computer. Okay. So if I go further, then one way of looking at it is, I could have rewritten the same code like this, load B into R1, load C into R2. And now I'm going to basically say this add R1, R1, R2, that is to say, take R1 plus R2 and put the result in R1, right, is what I'm going to do, which means basically that R1 now corresponds to A from this point onwards. Why does that work? Because if you look at the code, you will see that I never use B again. So why use a register and keep B over there when I'm never going to use that register again? Okay. And now similarly, R2 is also free because I'm never going to use C again. Right. So I can load R, uh, E into R2. Effectively, in other words, I can do the entire thing with just two registers. Okay. How do I generalize this? Let's look at a more complex example, right, with a few more instructions out here. What I can say is, I can take this particular uh, problem and construct a graph, right? I've used dots over here instead of circles to indicate the different nodes in this graph. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, those are uh, G and H, right? These are the different variables present in the code that I have. Now, once again, right, you look at this code and it's very obvious that F, G, H, there are like a whole lot of variables I'm bringing in over here for no particular reason, right? I could probably have reused some of the variables. Uh, for example, you know, after, by the time I'm computing F, I see that A never appears again on the right hand side. I don't need the value of A anymore. I could just have used A equal to D minus B. That might have worked. Okay. So anyway, uh, point is, Every time I have something like B plus C, it means that I have a constraint. B and C cannot be in the same register. Right? So if I go down that set of instructions, I can see that A and E cannot be in the same register, D and B cannot, B and E cannot, C and E cannot. Right? These, in other words, are conflicts which I cannot have two of these values in the same register, right? Because at some point in the code, they will have a conflict, okay? Now, I can take this and I can basically say, I'm going to treat this as a problem of how do I color this graph, right? How do I assign colors to each of the vertices in such a way that no two 
edges and vertices, that is, vertices that are joined by an edge, have the same color. Okay. Let's take a look at a sort of a greedy example of an algorithm that can be used in order to solve this, right? What I'm going to do is take the color blue and give it to H. Right? Why H? Something to the leftmost vertex that I could see. Right? Now, is there any conflict with H? No, nothing that I can see. So fine, I can go ahead and assign G also the same color. Right? Same with F. Now, I assign it to A, but at that point I have a problem. It means that I can no longer assign that color blue to the vertex E. Right? There's a conflict between A and D. E. But I can still assign it to B. So let's go forward, assign it to B. And at that point, I find that everything else has a conflict. I can't assign it to anything else. Okay. So now change colors. Give green to C. Okay. Once again, I have a conflict with E. But there's no conflict with D. So let's go ahead and assign the same green to D as well. Okay. And now that I've done all of this, I can go forward and finally assign red to E. So in other words, I have managed to color this entire graph with three different colors. The interpretation is that I could have implemented this entire piece of code with three registers. Right? And which registers they essentially correspond to the different colors that I have assigned. Because as long as I have those colors, it means that there will be no conflict at any point in time. Okay? Now, this is interesting, right? It is a very simple algorithm to implement. Does it always work? Let's take an example, right? So this is another graph that I have got, which again looks fairly straightforward, right? There are a lot of edges over here. But let's go ahead and use exactly the same algorithm that I used just now, right? Take the color blue and assign it to one, okay? Now, obviously it means that there are problems with all of these edges, right? I can't assign that same color to any of these, right? So four, six and eight are out but I could still assign it to any of the others. So let me pick two. Now what happened? Four, six and eight were already out because of one. But now because I assigned it to two, it means three, five and seven are also out. Okay, which means I need to choose a new color. All right, go forward, take three and give it green, which means that at this point, six and eight are out. Right? I still have 4, 5 and 7 to choose. Choose 4. 6 and 8 were already out. 5 and 7 are also out. And I end up having to choose one more color. Right? Now go to yellow for 5 and go to 6. Once again, 7 and 8 have conflicts. So I need a new color for 7 and 8. Okay? So I have essentially tried to solve this with 4 colors. Question is, was this optimal? Right, or could I have done it with less? Obviously, since I'm bringing this up in, you know, over here, it looks as though the answer must be that there, you know, there's something better so I, that I could have done. Right, start again from the same place, assign blue to one, but now instead of going to two, assign blue uh, to three. Right, three does not conflict with four. Right, so I, I mean, I, I, I still don't have any problems, and of course, uh, there are conflicts over here because I assigned it to one. I cannot have this, this, this. Three also essentially rules out these, right? So now I basically, because of one, four, six, and eight are gone. Because of three, two is also gone, but five and seven are still there, which means I can now assign it to five and I can assign it to seven. At this point, everything is conflicted, right? choose the next color, red goes to 2, but it turns out that I can just use red for everything else as well. Okay, so this is an example to show that the simple algorithm that I came up with for coloring, right, which in fact I can write this way, the, here is the, the algorithm that I have, I start off by saying this is the active color, right, I'm just giving it a number instead of a color. I will basically take the non-empty nodes, color them, and delete all the neighbors, right? Once I have done this, I basically, once I have run out of possibilities over here, I go to the next color, 
and repeat until the entire graph has been colored. Okay, I will leave it to you to sort of go through this graph and uh, this algorithm and understand how it works, right? But the important point over here is it is not optimal. It is not guaranteed to be optimal, right? That is why I have used the word heuristic instead of algorithm. If I take a look at the running time of this, essentially what I'll find is that, you know, I have something which goes like this can go V times, this can also go V times, this could also potentially go V times. So running time of this could be something like V cubed, right? Which is not great, but on the other hand is still polynomial. It's not exponential running time. Okay. Uh, but the bigger problem is not so much the running time. The bigger problem is the fact that there is no guarantee of it being optimal at all, right? Of it actually giving you the correct answer. So to summarize, right, we need some kind of a basic understanding of algorithms in order to appreciate EDA problems. What is EDA? Electronic Design Automation. And one important thing to keep in mind over here is the algorithms that I'm talking about over here are not actually the algorithms that are the DSP algorithms like the fast Fourier transform or the discrete cosine transform, right? Those are also algorithms in the sense that they are once again a sequence of steps in order to solve a problem. But over there, we usually have a fixed size. For example, I would talk about something like a 512 point FFT or a 4096 point FFT. I really don't care about million point FFTs or billion point FFTs, right? So the asymptotic complexity as n becomes larger and larger is not so much of an issue for a DSP algorithm or rather that's not the main thing that we are focused on. Right? And the other thing that I wanted to bring out was the fact that there are a lot of graph theory concepts and algorithms that are used. They will all continue to be used in a lot of the remaining part of the course as we move forward. And some of the terminology that we have associated with this is something that you need to be aware of.